before we tear apart today's obscure and uh, questionable 90s laptops, a quick word about the sponsor of today's video, Shaker and Spoon. Now, usually when I choose sponsors for these videos, I try to pick ones that I think would be relevant specifically to the world of tech. But sometimes I pick one just because I want it. Shaker and Spoon is a subscription service that teaches you how to make high quality cocktails with some really awesome ingredients. Rare and hard to find ingredients are included right in the box with house-made syrups, bitters, garnishes, infusions, all nicely labeled and well-packed. I was honestly surprised at just how nice everything looked right out of the box. Each box contains all of the ingredients for about 12 cocktails minus the alcohol, and all the recipes are a nice mix centered around one specific spirit. Again, I really wanted this one. This one is for me. Use my link in the description box below and my code ActionRetro for $20 off your Shaker and Spoon subscription. In the late 90s, the personal computer industry progressed furiously at a breakneck pace of innovation. 486, then Pentiums, Power Max, processor clock speeds doubling and tripling every year. The burgeoning web growing ever hungrier for raw computing power. And into this fray comes brother like a glorious sloth, and they say nay, 386. Well, I've become obsessed with these underpowered goofball relics of the anything goes 90s computer industry, and somehow <laughs> I now have two of them. So stay tuned. And if you enjoy falling ever deeper into the madness that is obscure 90s computers, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I don't always get this philosophical at the start of my videos, but when I do, it's usually a lack of sleep. A few weeks ago, we messed around with this brother laptop from 1997. We discovered that it ran on a goofy 386 system on a chip with no real storage and represented a horrible value at hundreds of dollars in the time of power max pentiums and rapid computing progress. It was also one of the last consumer products to run a relatively full version of the super interesting GUI GEOS. Or GEOS as some of you insist and uh, you're probably right about that. Anyway, GEOS was an incredibly powerful graphical environment that started out on machines like the Commodore 64 and gave you a workable GUI on machines like 8086s. We'll explore that further in a future video. But today, I want to focus on another aspect of these machines. The fact that they're ostensibly DOS compatible and they try really, really hard to run DOS software. We had some issues getting things to run correctly on the CGA only low end um, Super Power Note Graphic PN 9000 GR. Catchy. But Brother actually released two higher end versions with VGA and backlit displays. This is the grayscale one, and there's also a color one that's uh, <laughs> impossible to find. Now, I know you all like the whiteboard guy, and uh, he would just tell me to throw these things straight in the garbage. But unfortunately, he just couldn't be here today. So we're just gonna have to soldier on without him and try a whole bunch of goofy, fun shenanigans with our two geobooks. Now, let's talk about exactly what we have here. For the most part, they're the same exact computer, even though they were marketed differently. When we took apart the uh, PN9000GR last time, we found a motherboard with tons of unpopulated solder pads, including empty areas for a PCMCIA card slot here and an area for a modem in the back. Now, when we look at the GeoBook NB60, touted as more of a full-fledged laptop, it's exactly the same down to the floppy drive, but there's a door here with that PCMCIA card slot, and there is a modem on the back here, exactly where the empty solder pads were on the cheaper GeoBook. I bet if we take both of these machines apart, we're gonna find the same motherboard just this one has all the stuff populated, whereas this one has a whole bunch of empty solder pads. 
I also want to do some stuff like uh, combine some parts to make the best possible geo book because uh, yeah, this trackpad's a little grungy and this one's quite nice. Most importantly, I want to see how far we can push this more capable geo book. Maybe we can install Linux. Probably not, but I'll be darned if we're not going to try. Okay, so we won't dwell too much on the super power note here since we already explored the heck out of it in this video here. Instead, I want to focus on the GeoBook NB60 here. So the biggest change over the super power note is that we have a full VGA backlit grayscale LCD and color on the more expensive model. It is passive matrix, but uh, yeah, it's really not too bad. And not only does it support VGA on this internal grayscale screen, but it supports color VGA out. Yeah. So we're actually going to get screen capture out of this thing. Although unfortunately we can't double screen battle station this thing. It's one screen or the other, but hey, look at that. It's GEOS in color. All right. So here's our battle station. Let's switch to some screen capture. So since we have this running all nice in color, with screen capture, this is probably a good time to poke around PC Geos running on top of DOS. Now this is actually just the same exact suite of applications as on the cheaper word processor oriented GeoBook. And uh, yeah, pretty sure this is gonna be the same exact processor as well. Although being that this is actually GeoWorks, this is a very full featured suite of applications. I mean, this word processor, is very modern. I mean, it was perfectly capable from 1997 standards, even though the machine wasn't really built to 1997 standards. And uh, let's see if there were any documents on here. Oh yeah, look at this. Because the other quirk of this system, I think this does have non-volatile memory. And I mean, it definitely has non-volatile memory because look at this. This is saved documents from the previous owner. <laughs> look at that. Isn't that adorable? I'm going to imagine that these two are still together and they have a ton of kids and they've bought each kid their own incredibly underpowered netbook. Now I'm curious about internet here because this seems to be a little bit more set up than the previous one. We have a web browser, uh, a setup here, which... Uh, that has somebody's login information from 20 years ago. <laughs> but I took a look at the web browser earlier when I first got this machine and I was very surprised to see this. Check this out. Yeah, look in their bookmarks here. I'll blur out these uh, 20 year old email addresses, although I don't think Prodigy is even still around. But somebody was using this and they were doing eBay stuff. How cool is that to see 20 years later on this extremely underpowered machine with 30 year old technology. Yeah, somebody was really using this for its intended purpose back in the day. But I wanna check out the drawing application now that I have, well, a mouse and we have color and screen capture. Let's see if I can do uh, my thumbnails from here. All right, looking pretty good. Now let's try to draw something here. Let's draw a Macintosh. Uh, really, hourglass after drawing a square? Okay, well, true test of any drawing program, how well can it follow a fastly drawn line? Uh-oh contains a large number of unsaved changes. I think we hit the RAM limit here. <laughs> Let's look at what I find most interesting. File manager. And I find this most interesting really because this is the best look at the GEOS running under the hood. And uh, yeah, especially once you go into windowed mode here and start opening up some overlapping windows and dragging them around, this is what PC Geos looks like. And if you recognize some of these window controls here, that's because it's using the Motif UI components used by 
other GUIs like the CDE common desktop environment. And that is pretty cool. Okay, so now it's time to try some hackery on this thing. I discovered a couple secrets that have been uh, hidden for years, or maybe just nobody cared enough to preserve them, but I found some startup key trickery that we can do. For instance, if I turn the machine on and just spam the F5 key, really freaking spam the F5 key, check it out. It says bypassing config.sys and autoexec.bat. And from here, I can just go directly into ROMDOS 622, and that is very helpful. I also found another one by spamming the F8 key, where it does kind of an interactive prompt for, uh, I don't know, whatever it wants to do. But that one's not so interesting to me. And how did I discover these startup keys, you may ask? Did I do some really cool disassembly of the ROM? No. Even better. Does this one do anything? Damn it. Does this one do anything? Damn it. Does this one do anything? All right, and since we're in DOS, we can run some DOS software. Starting with, let's see exactly what's in this machine. Oh yeah, 33 megahertz, 386. Exactly as we thought. But this really confirms that it's almost the same machine as the brother Power Note. It's the 386SX, 33 megahertz, with an AT&T computer name, a BIOS in 1997. But this one has four megs of RAM. So yeah, at least that's an upgrade. Okay, so I wanna try some external storage on here and uh, yeah, I have a backpack parallel CD-ROM drive, and I also have a PC card CD-ROM drive, but I can't seem to find it. I wonder where it could be. Oh, how did you get out? Thanks, uh, buddy. Okay, so I can't get these CD-ROM drives to work, although it actually powers my cool Vio PC card CD-ROM drive from the slot here, the machine hangs during boot if this thing is plugged in. And the backpack, I suspect the reason it doesn't work is because it's not loading the CD-ROM driver for DOS. Even though I have that driver, MSCDEX, on this disk, uh, I just can't figure out how to get it to work. I also tried a parallel zip drive, but uh, it will not see this at all, so... Yeah, I have one other thing that I want to try. This is a PC card CF adapter and a 512 meg CF card. And uh, yeah, this adapter has worked in every old computer I've ever tried it in. So let's give it a shot in here. And there it is. Look at that, PC card. And oh, I have free DOS on here from when I was, I think, playing around with my Toshiba libretto. So uh, yeah, I wonder how much of this would actually work on here. So let's try some free DOS games. <laughs> Look, it's Flappy Bird. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it runs and it registers the key press, surprisingly. Oh, that's actually really exciting. Okay. <laughs> Does not run very fast though. So we have DOS compatibility, VGA, and a 386. We've got to try Wolfenstein 3D. Now I let it load into GEOS so that we have a mouse driver because that's how I like to play Wolfenstein. Hey! All right. Now, will the keyboard work? So far so good. Oh man, if this works, <laughs> I'm gonna be so excited. There's no audio for some reason. Uh-oh. I pushed the down arrow and it interpreted that as enter, I guess. Oh no. Nothing works. Uh, I think it is not gonna work with this keyboard. I know what we can run. DOS demo scene stuff. And uh, this first one here, 
I'm almost positive it's gonna work because it is everyone's favorite Bad Apple demo done in 8086 assembler and it should run on pretty much any 8086 and up processor. Plus the music is done to the PC speaker, which makes sense on this machine because I think that's the only sound it has. So here we go. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, so all of the other demos either didn't launch or crashed uh, spectacularly. So there's one thing left to do. Let's try to get Linux to boot. All right, so we are going to use something called load ling, which is an old school way to load Linux from DOS. And when this loads Linux, it actually replaces DOS in memory with Linux. And the Linux I've chosen is Debian 1.5.1, I think, because the system requirements require less than four megs of RAM. And I think that's about the latest version of Debian that could potentially work on this system. So there is a file here called boot.bat, which runs loadlin.exe for the Linux file, the compressed system, and uh, runs it into a RAM disk. And uh, yeah. Let's see if this works. So all we should need to do here is just type boot. And hey, it's going. Hi, <laughs> look at that, uncompressing Linux. Oh my God, look, it's booting the kernel. <laughs> it sees the floppy drive as FD0. Oh, it sees HDA1, the compressed image found at block zero. Uh-oh. I have discovered a problem. <laughs> Keyboard, unrecognized scan code. Yeah, once again, the curse of this goofy non-standard keyboard and it's, uh, I guess, incorrect scan codes that this machine's BIOS makes up for, but Linux cannot make heads or tails of, at least this old version of Linux. Well, that's a shame, but hey, technically, I think it did boot Linux. <laughs> it just can't do anything else. All right, let's rip this thing open and see what's inside. Okay, so I've got both machines apart here, and just as we suspected, it is the same motherboard between the two machines, just the GeoBook is fully populated and the Super Power Note is missing a lot of those components. Okay, so thank you so much for indulging me in my strange new obsession with these super goofy brother GeoBooks. I don't know what it is about these things. I just, I can't stop messing with it. Whether it's the obscurity of it or the fact that it runs kind of the last gasp of GEOS. The fact that it's so limited, but we can kind of finesse it into doing some things it was never intended for. Or just the fact that Brother was so brash to try to hawk a 386 machine in the late 90s. I feel like there's more we can do with these machines still. And hopefully you want to see it because uh, I think maybe we can find some way to get this thing to boot Linux off of that CF card and get around the limitation of the goofball keyboard. Maybe some later versions of the kernel can actually deal with this, or maybe we can figure out some way to remap the keyboard. I don't know. Good thing I have some pretty smart Linux friends. Anyway, that'll do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you like this GeoBook stuff because uh, I, I just love this stupid thing. But if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more Geos shenanigans like this, please subscribe down below. Thank you very much for watching.
And a special thanks to Alberto Guerre, Camilla Noceda, Chris Allegretta, Chris Briggs, Chris Calderon, Chris Nelson, Cobalt Retrotech, Control Alt Reese, Daniel Hubbard, Greg from Rutke Mods, Paul Spencer, Ryan, Scott Thompson, and Sutek, who are my highest tiered patrons and all of my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible.